when the tournament will hold with the, the cornhole, um, which is always pretty fun. So that's August 21st, churchwide, and there's going to be food there. So it's going to be a great time, food, family, fellowship. Uh, so those two dates are important. And then we, our co-op collection is going to be uh, finishing up for July this next coming week. So we have that going on, uh, the food. If you bring stuff in, you just put it in on these tables back here in that foyer area. Um, so that's going to be collected and done for this month next week. And then finally, we have our Activate Youth Group pizza party after church, after this service here at like 1230. They have pizza, ice cream, toppings, and that's for the youth, their parents, and family. So all the kids, parents, everybody's invited. Um, so that's right after service, pizza, ice cream, should be a great time. Um, so that is all the announcements this morning. So uh, turn around, greet some people, shake some hands. sing together. Uh, we're going to read a, a little bit. Uh, we're going to read a little passage together. Tony, you make this sure, make sure this is out in the, in the house a little bit more, please. We're going to read a little psalm. Before we stand, uh, y- y'all, can, y'all can hang out for just a second. We're going to read through Psalm 103 together, have our minds centered on truth before we stand and sing.
Father, we thank you that you are who you are, that you are great, and that we see all, of, all through nature, and everything is praising you. It all shows your handiwork, and your son said that if we didn't cry out, then the stones would cry out. They just can't hold back, and everything in creation just shouts your glory. It shows how powerful that you are. And man's almost unique in the fact that we have to choose, but we, to, to give you the glory, but we thank you that you give us the opportunity to, to choose that. And we thank you that we are able to do that and recognize who you are and have a relationship with you. And we thank you that you remember that we are but dust, as Psalm 103 said, and we, we ask for your help to get to know you more. And, um, but we thank you for all of the blessings that you do give us, and we, we, we wish to praise you now. Um, and I ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So Pastor John is out um, this week, then him and Miss Tracy are on vacation. So, uh, so be in prayer for them as they're traveling and just that they have a relaxing time as well where they're at and uh, come back refreshed. And, um, but so Pastor John has been moving through Daniel. I'm just gonna let him continue that. So I'm gonna pick up, I'm gonna do a different thing, kind of a one-off. And it's Ephesians 2, one through 10. So if you wanna turn there in your Bibles, but Ephesians 2, one through 10. And the, the concept there is we were spiritually dead. That's how we start out as humans, spiritually dead, disconnected from God. And we gain life from God. And, uh, and then we use that and uh, perform good works and we get to know God more. So that's kind of the concept. But as you look at the world and just everything that's happening today, and uh, people see that there's something wrong, that there are things that are still going wrong today and we wonder why and we try to find answers for those things. So we kind of wonder how do we fix them? And so some people um, reach for politicians and say, you know, maybe we can legislate a good way and have that fix our problem. Maybe it's education. Everyone's fundamentally good, right? So we can educate them to where when they have a trouble time, a troubling time, they can choose the better way. They don't choose the negative way because they have the education. They've been uh, enlightened to uh, away from their old ways. So that's kind of what people think about as far as the answers for these things, because there's a prevailing idea that people are kind of fundamentally good. And if we could only fix our surroundings, our circumstances, we would manipulate the world into a, a paradise. And so that's kind of the aim that some people have. Um, and there was even an idea of, that was connected to religion as well called the social gospel. And so the, the concept there was we were trying to fix the things around us, get everyone on the same level and have uh, circumstances be good for everyone. And so then like people would understand the gospel better and they would, and we'd kind of bring heaven to earth in some way. So that's kind of the idea of what they're trying to do. But that idea was really catching on the late 1800s and early 1900s. So the social gospel is really picking up and they think like, boy, we're, we're really getting somewhere with all this stuff and the world's getting so much better. But does anyone know what happens in the 1900s? <laughs> like <laughs> the world wars. So World War I breaks out, the Great Depression, the World War II. So this kind of crippled the idea that like we can kind of perfect everything because we were at a pinnacle in a way. And then it, it, it pretty much just opened up the way for some of the worst things that have happened in time so far. Um, and so it kind of made everybody question things, which led to postmodernism and this questioning of everything. Is there, is there absolute truth? So there was this shift away from that, but people still want to try and follow that avenue. They still want to perfect the stuff around us to in turn perfect people because they think it's external is what's affecting the people. But we see that that's not working. Like we're in every uh, metric, I think like besides a few, we're, we're improving as a, as a people and the whole world, like the, the um, median age of uh, life expectancy is way higher than it's ever been. World hunger is at an all time low. We have connection. We can talk to people in China instantly over the internet. So there's a lot of things that have improved science and medicine. Um, but the, 
if there was, if, if we could perfect it through circumstances, you'd think that today we'd have the best people that ever lived because we have the best circumstances that have ever been, but that's not necessarily true. We still have a lot of problems. There's still a lot of things that are happening. Um, and so why, why does that turn out like that? And it's because it's not the circumstances that are the problem. It's internally in people because we're spiritually dead. There's a spiritual deadness about people before they come to Christ. And that's what's really is the problem that needs to be addressed. And one problem is, is that we can't address that ourselves. We can't, we can't move in, we can't get holy enough to make ourselves spiritually alive. That's the problem that we're in as humans. We need an outside source to come to us and help us and, and to do something for us. And that's God. He comes in and gives us spiritual life and takes us from spiritual death to spiritual life, all of God. So that's what people really need. They need this fundamental change. Um, and there's an example, there's examples all through history of Christians having that change. But the kind of change that we need to have happen in the world for people to improve and to, and to think of others more than themselves is this spiritual life. One example of this is Augustine in uh, 400s AD, he lived and he thought about all these things and he became, he got this new life. And it's such a drastic change that an example that he gave of what this looks like is he lived just a party and he just was with all these girls and he uh, partied all the time. But when he got this new life, uh, he was reading Romans 13 one day and just it completely altered him. So he got spiritual life. And it was such a fundamental shift that he said he was walking down the street one day and one girl that he had known before came up and said, it is I, Augustine, turn around. And he just wouldn't, he just kept walking. And so she keeps chasing after him saying, it is I, Augustine, turn around. He won't do it. So she finally catches up with them and says, Augustine, it is I, what are you doing? And he says, but it is not I. He wasn't the same person anymore that he used to be. He was walking away from all of that. He's a new life. And that's the fundamental change that happens when someone moves from death, spiritual death, to spiritual life. And that's what I, I want to look at today. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 really walks through that. And verses 1 through 3 talk about spiritual death, where we are naturally. Then 4 through 7 talk about the life that we gain. And then 8 through 10 is, talks about what happens after that. We are his workmanship. So let's read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 as a jumping off point. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So I want to look at beginning here, verses 1 through 3. It talks about us being spiritually dead. And the reason we are spiritually dead is this sins and trespasses that it talks about. Sins being actions against God, trespasses being we never matched up to the holiness of God. We've overshot, we've missed the mark of holiness, and we have to pay for that. So us being spiritually dead, we get, what that looks like is we spiritually, we just cannot respond to any stimulus that we encounter. So um, I, what, what, what it made me think of is I had a fish, um, a betta fish named Morado, and he was purple. So I think uh, Morado is Spanish for purple. So we just named him that. And uh, this fish though, when we first got him, he had this sore on his side. And they say when the fish has that sore that they aren't going to live long. So we kind of knew this about this fish, like he's probably going to have trouble. But I think the max life for a betta fish is like two years or something. 
this fish lived to be like a year and three quarters somehow. <laughs> it was always encouraging me to come home and see, he's still around, wow. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes he wouldn't look like he's doing that great. Like, you know, he's just kind of there and I would tap on the glass, he'd come to life all of a sudden. It's like, wow. Until one day, you know, I didn't, I kept tapping and he just wasn't, he was in fishy heaven. <laughs> so no matter how many times I tapped on the glass, you know, he's not coming back. He's, he's in fishy heaven. Um, and that is similar to how we are spiritually. No matter how many times we get tapped on the glass, we're not coming back because spiritually we're just not there. So when we see like a sunrise, we see it's beautiful, but we don't connect that to God, the spiritual truth of that. When we see like sacrificial love and we see all the beautiful things in life that spiritually affect us, it's, it's falling on dead ears before we get spiritual life. It just, it, we can't comprehend it. So that's what it is. You're spiritually dead. You can't see the truth behind everything that's around us, all the life that we see, all the beautiful things. And it's not saying that the people that are spiritually dead are not physically alive. Obviously, they're alive physically. And people can do a lot of cool things that are spiritually dead, like a lot of scientists, a lot of really cool things. You know, they, there's people way smarter than me that are atheists and, you know, that they're spiritually alive to think. There's they're, they're physically alive to think through things, but spiritually they just cannot get there because 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. So they just can't understand it. They can't comprehend that this, this spiritual truth is pointing to something else, um, even though they're super smart. So as we're looking at this, we are everyone, the Ephesians, the people around the Ephesian church, the people around us today, are spiritually dead, um, naturally. And it's because of these sins and trespasses that have separated us from God. We have actions against God we have to pay for. We have uh, ways in that which we haven't reached the mark of being holy. So what the world needs is this spiritual life. They need God to work in their life and to make them spiritually alive. That's the main problem. So that's verse one. Verse two kind of talks about what's naturally occurring with these spiritually dead people. And what's being, what those people are being affected by is the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the world, firstly, is, it's like a, it's a whole setting, it's a whole uh, system of beliefs and, and ways of doing things that the world has created outside of God's order. So we have this, this whole separate thing of standards that the people are just kind of going along with, just going down the stream with this way of doing things. And it, it, it reminded me again that we're, me and my wife were just at the beach with our baby last week and uh, we're going, we're walking down the beach and we saw a fish kind of going in and out with the tide. And all of my things today are fish related, I guess, but it's a fish and he's not fighting the tide. So he's in fishy heaven as well. So he's coming in and out and he can't fight against it. It takes a live fish to go back into the ocean and start swimming again. So he's just kind of going in and out. He's not controlling it. And that's kind of how spiritually dead people are in this world system. They're being carried along by this tide of time and in these, in these standards that they have. And they, they can't even see that they're in the tide. They don't know that they're even following after it, but they are naturally just kind of going with it. Um, and that's, they can't even understand that that's the problem. So the world system is, is a part of it. Then flesh is another part of it. The fallen flesh is, is distracting. So we are naturally selfish. We're kind of turned in on ourselves as natural flesh beings. And we only want to satisfy what's in our minds and what our own desires are. Um, and I've heard it described as when people follow after the flesh, there's, it's really just taking the good things that God gives us in the wrong quantities, like at the wrong times. So there's good things like intimacy, food, and all these different things that we have in our life that are great, beautiful things. But the flesh takes that stuff and uses it in the wrong way and abuses it. And, and that's, that's how we misuse things in our life. And that's what the flesh naturally does. So the, the spiritually dead are in that system too, like using the, the flesh just kind of sees everything and they just satisfy their desires however they see fit. And then finally, the devil is the prince of the power of the air. So this is, there's this whole invisible realm that exists of, of you know, angels, demons, and things that are happening that we don't know a lot about, but it does affect our life on a daily basis. We just don't see it. Um, 
Pastor John's going to walk through Daniel and it talks about some of that as well. Like there's an invisible realm happening back there. And it's, it's, it's just interesting to think about though, because there is this overarching system of things that are happening that the devil's over and it's, it's affects, it affects us, um, but we don't know it and we can't see it. And if you've ever read the book Screwtape Letters, it's a cool book um, by C.S. Lewis. And it's talking about from the perspective of a demon trying to uh, tempt a person. So this demon's training his nephew, it's screw tape training Wormwood. And so he's telling him, you know, you're a beginner demon, but you can tempt them in these ways. Um, and it's during World War II. So he's doing this and it's just an interesting book because it goes behind the scenes and tries to like think through how that would all work. And it is interesting. Um, so if you're ever interested in looking into that, it's a pretty good book. It's kind of short too. But um, there is this whole system of things that are affecting us and we can't even see it. So there's that, that, that they're all kind of in that system. So you have the world, you have the flesh pulling, and then you have this invisible realm also. So that's kind of how the, um, the spiritually dead are following after this all naturally. So as we look at this spiritually dead, if we move on to verse three, he does also go and say, we were like them too. So he's not just saying these people out here are all spiritually lost and we have to win them. He's saying, we came from it too. And he's lumping himself in there with it. So Paul, who was raised Jewish, you know, it's Jewish. And he, in his mind, thought he was doing the best that he could. Like he thought he was a top tier Jew. But he says that I was a child of wrath as well. So he's saying I, he discounts all of that. And he, sa he says in other places too, like he doesn't even count that stuff anymore. He only looks forward to Christ. And this is what counts. This is what really matters. And so he's saying he was a child of wrath as well. But um, as we go through here, it says, we were all dead. We Ephesian people at that church, we, us today, we're all spiritually dead to begin with. And we need life. We need something to act on our behalf. But when it says here, children of wrath, <clears throat> um, it means when it says you're a child of something, it just means you're characterized by that. So <clears throat> this wrath that's on, on all people that we're naturally just kind of going towards wrath, going towards doom, and, and condemnation that characterizes us. And it shows itself in these ways, uh, following after the world and the flesh and the devil. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of like the, it's, we're children of that system because that's how we think and we're naturally in it. Um, and being, us being declared children of wrath um, is, is revealing because some people think that God can't have wrath because God is love. So if God is love, you wouldn't send someone to hell. You wouldn't uh, punish someone, a sinner. Um, but that's, it's, a, it's just the wrong way of thinking because when you look at the whole idea of the gospel and how it all works, you have Jesus who had to pay for something. If it's just love, what is he paying for? So why do you have to die on the cross if there's no wrath to absorb, if there's no sin to take, um, no punishment to take? Uh, so it makes sense that there is wrath that needs to be accounted for and so we can't go and say, you know, God's not wrathful. God doesn't have justice. He has all of those things. It's a bigger picture. Um, so it's not, he is love, but it's not just love. There is other parts to him as well. Um, and so wrath is a part of this. Um, and we're all, there's no really degrees of spiritual death. We can't be partially dead and partially alive. You, just because you're raised in a religious home doesn't make you any more spiritually alive than anybody else. We're all equally there together. Um, and it's almost with religion, it can almost make you feel, it almost makes it harder to accept your case as a sinner in needing of salvation because you almost see your life as being worthy of, of credit in some way. So you think like, I'm not that bad. You know, maybe if the good I have done will outweigh the bad I have done. But you know, when you have a person that's been out sinning their whole life and just ran their life into a gutter they can say, you know, I've had wrong stuff happen. I can understand I need forgiveness. So sometimes it's easier for that person than it is for the religious person. Um, and I, there's an example of this uh, by a, a man named John Wesley who began the Methodist movement. Um, and he just couldn't have a, a confirmation in his own mind of his salvation. He always doubted it, but he was doing really amazing things. So he was in England and he's just working and uh, really leading some religious Bible studies and things, but he just didn't feel like he was saved. He wasn't convinced all the way in his mind. So he wanted to make this big event experience. So he chose to go to America, to Georgia, Savannah, and go to Savannah and minister to the Native Americans in Savannah. 
because in the 1700s, there were still Native Americans in Savannah. Um, so he wanted to go there to minister to them. He did, and for a few years he did that um, and did that good action. And then over time, he eventually had this event where he, it finally clicked for him. And he said, okay, I believe there's nothing in me that I am bringing before God for my salvation. It is only God. It's Jesus. He's the only thing I have to stand before God with. That finally clicked for him, but he was 38. So this man, <laughs> 38 before that really clicked for him. Um, and so he was spiritually dead as, as much as anybody else spiritually dead, a lost person, you know, a person secular and living however. So there's an equal playing field for all of us in that way. And we all need God. We can't earn our way towards it, no matter what we do. Um, we all fall short of the glory of God, as Romans 3, uh, 3.23 says. So there is that, that's our situation. And it is kind of depressing, short of something changing, right? Like that, if we're stuck there, we're in a bad spot um, and we can't save ourselves. Um, but that's not where it stops. We have verse four in one of the more beautiful uh, portions of the Bible, but God did this stuff, did these things. He took action and that's, a, that's beautiful. So, but God did this, he gave us life, um, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us. Amazing. So it's, but God moved and it's a Trinitarian action, really. It's truly God doing this. Um, God the Father elects in chapter one. It's the Son dies and atones for us. And then the Spirit is the one that moves and regenerates us. So God the Trinity is taking action in our lives, but God is regenerating us and giving us the spiritual life. But then he makes us alive. Um, and that's a good thing because we were hopeless. We, were, we couldn't save ourselves. And in fact, we're enemies to him. We're all in the world, the flesh, the devil. We're following after that against his system. So he did this, rich in mercy, for his enemies. We were against everything that he was doing, but he chose not to save his friends, but to save the people working against him, which was us. So he moved and saved us even though we were his enemies. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. And this change that happens when he gives life is a drastic change. It's going to be a drastic change, and it doesn't always show itself the same way for everyone. Sometimes it looks a little different. But this, this change that happens is people compare it to Lazarus being brought from the dead. So Lazarus is dead. No matter how much, how, no matter how loud people would scream at Lazarus to come out of the grave, he's not going anywhere. He's not responding to any stimulus. You can't shake him awake, right? He's gone. There's nothing going to happen with him for days. And then Jesus comes and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he sparks, to, he comes to life because God called him out. Jesus called him and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he did because he gave him life. And he couldn't do that on his own. He couldn't earn that. He needed God to come call him forth from it. And, and that's what God did. So people compare it to that. We're spiritually dead. We can't do anything. We can't, we're just there. And then God says, come forth. And boom, we're alive. He, he brings us out of it, or gives us that life. So, but it's not always an emotional event either. Like sometimes we think we need this like this shifting moments to where, you know, um, and it has to, we have to be crying and saying, you know, and it can happen like that. That's perfectly, that's great. It just doesn't look the same for everybody. Sometimes it's just a knowledge and, ex and uh, acceptance in your own mind and, and moving forward from there. Jesus says in Mark 4 that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that falls into the ground and then it starts to grow. But you can't really see, like when a seed falls into the ground, you don't necessarily see it's, action until it starts coming up. So that's the same way. And he says that that tree grows to give shade to people. One of the smallest seeds become this mighty tree. And that's with our spiritual life. Sometimes it's super tiny and we can't even, no one's going to even know there was a difference in you sometimes. But over time that will show, like there will be fruit. Like you can't be a Christian and not have fruit because th that will grow and it does reveal itself. But it doesn't always have this huge bang at the beginning. Um, it, sometimes it's not as emotional as other people, but it's still just as much life as the other person's life. So we have that life begin, and, and not all the time is it something that changes your circumstances. Um, you, we have prosperity preachers that will go through and say, come to Christ and you'll get your breakthrough and you'll get your car paid off and the, the floodgates of heaven will just open up and you'll have a great life, live your best life now. And it simply doesn't happen like that. God can do that. Like if, you know, it's nothing's impossible, but that's not normative for a Christian. What's going to happen in your life is it's a spiritual life that's come to be, and you'll start to see things differently. 
but it's not an automatic like answer to all your problems. Sometimes it gets more difficult as a Christian. Like you, you have to address the things in your life at that point. Um, and so it's not going to look the same for everyone, but normally it's usually kind of difficult. If it was uh, serving God the best you can and you have a good life, Jesus would have had a very comfortable life, it would seem, being the son of God. But he didn't have a comfortable life. He didn't have a home. Like He died on the cross and because people, you know, his own people turned. So if there was truly, you know, this prosperity thing, Jesus would have not died on the cross. So um, that's, it doesn't always turn into circumstances, but it does change you fundamentally because you then have spiritual life. Augustine did uh, also talked about this, th- uh, this change again, and he said, the flesh naturally, when it's spiritually dead, is basically turned in on itself. So your actions that you're doing and everything that you want to accomplish really is all for the point of coming back into yourself and fulfilling your desires and your needs and, and making sure that you have everything that you need uh, before everyone else. What happens when you gain spiritual life is that shifts to, it bends out to others. So you've been bent out from yourself to serve other people and serve God. And, and so you start to think of yourself less and think of others more. So as we're walking, and then as we're walking through here, this, this change, what's causing it, what's the catalyst? And then in verse five, it's, I, I think it's kind of funny because he says, made, made us alive with Christ, though we are dead in trespasses, you were saved by grace. He also raised us up. So he kind of is telling us where we are with life. And then as he's giving us the description, he's like, grace, and then he keeps going. So it's like, he just couldn't contain the fact that it's grace that's doing this. And he, it just gives that interjection. And it kind of reminds me in a book when you have a, a superscript like one or two, and then it's, it's showing that there's notes at the bottom of the page. Um, and it's kind of like that, like he's saying grace, and then at eight through 10, he's gonna tell us what that means. But at that point, it's still just like, this is what you've gained in life and life, grace, life, life, life. So it's just kind of cool. Um, I think he was excited about that. Um, but so then this is a drastic change that's going to happen in our lives. And, but again, it's nothing that we do. It's nothing, we can't earn it. It's not a result of what we have done. What it is from is our connection in Christ. And we see that all through this passage. It's all in Christ. Um, if you look in verse five, it says, made us alive with Christ. Verse six, uh, with him, you've been raised with him in the heavens in Christ. Verse seven, uh, display these riches through him to us, kindness in Christ. Um, and then in verse 10, it says it again, uh, in Christ. So all through here, it's not saying, good job, you've been saved. You gained all this. It's saying, you're now saved. You've been given life because of your connection to Christ. Because of what he did, he gained all of these things. He, it's his reward that he's now exchanging with you. So I, everything that you have been raised you've been seated, you have all of these benefits, eternal life. It's all Christ's. He's gained it. And we, he's just chosen to share that stuff with us. So all of it that we've gained in Christ, with Christ, because of Christ, it's all of our connection with Christ. And someone has said it like this, every part of our Christian life is because of our connection with Christ. We are crucified with him. We die with him. We rise with him. We live in him. We reign with him. We're joint heirs of everything with him. We suffer with him and we will glory with him. We'll be glorified. So it's all in connection to Christ. And that's that, it's just a beautiful exchange. What Christ earned with his perfect life and his sacrifice before God, we gain because of mercy and grace, because we had the sin. All we contribute towards our salvation is the sin and the shortcomings. And Jesus says, give me that if you're willing and you can have this, which is, an amazing thing. Like, why would he do that? It's just because he wants to. Like, it's his own glory. Because of his glory, he comes to us and says, here, make this exchange. So, um, a beautiful thing. And what's happening through that, as we gain those things, as we grow in Christ, as we live out this life, we are trophies of grace. We're trophies of his. And that's what it says in verse 7. Uh, we are trophies to be shown off for all eternity because of what he did. So, we get eternal life before God, showing the mercy and grace that he had. So throughout eternity, you might stand next to the throne of God and people see you, all of creation sees you and says, boy, how did that person get there? Like they were a child of wrath. All they deserved was eternal punishment and condemnation. What happened? 
Like, why would God do this? Give them for free this life and all of these benefits. And they'll, they'll, they'll say, because God's amazing. God's, it's, they're looking to him and it's all his grace and mercy that he did the thing. So a trophy, like we're eternally going to show off that, you know, I didn't deserve any of this, but I was given it because God's mercy and grace. Um, but as we're here, we're still being shaped into those trophies. We're still uh, doing things through Christ uh, to be, continue his church and to do different things. Um, I kind of think of it as an artist making a portrait. So with the Mona Lisa, for example, um, with Mona Lisa, you see that, but you don't necessarily think about who that lady was. It would be kind of interesting to know, but I don't even think they know who it was that he was using. But it, Mona Lisa, um, you don't look at that painting and say, you know, what did she do for a living? Or you look at it and say, boy, Da Vinci knew what he was doing. Like he practiced a lot. He had a lot of skill. He was a genius. Like you look at him and say, you look at that and say, this was Da Vinci's work. And that's the same with us. Like when they see our life, they don't say, boy, Derek knew how to live. Like ideally they say God moved in Derek's life. God moved in your life and he did all of this change in you and you gave the glory to God. So it's all of him. But that's what verses eight through 10 talk about. It says we have this life, but now how does it play out? What does that look like? And it looks like us being his workmanship, but it's God that's doing all of the work. So if you look at eight and nine, for you are saved by grace. This is like the superscript of the first five by grace. And then it says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So when you look at this mercy, grace, and faith, the grace and the faith are gifts from God. So we know grace is a gift from God, but really faith is as well. The, the, even the ability to believe. And uh, Spurgeon said it this way, that he kind of said that um, the faith is really a conduit to get us the grace. And he said it was like a telegraph line because he's like in the 1850s. So a, ter- a telegraph line gives you an important message over that line tiny little line can, you know, a grain of a mustard seed, a tiny little line can get you grace, the connection to God to get the grace. I kind of think of it as a modern day example of a cell phone. So a cell phone, if you've got a message on your phone saying your your child got a scholarship, full ride to wherever, that's a great news, right? That's awesome. But you don't necessarily start to think about, I wonder how this got to my phone. You know, the airwaves, there's some type of beam, Let's think about that for a minute. Like you think like, wow, this is an amazing thing. So um, that's happening back there. There's some type of light wave that's connecting your phone to the cell tower, but that's not super important when you have the message. Like, so the faith is really kind of this connecting point to us, to God that gives us the grace, which is the good news, like the unmerited favor, the, the change in our lives, the grace that actually makes us alive. So the faith really connects us to that. And it can be as small as a mustard seed. But, and that, but you can't actually, God gives us that gift of faith and grace, but he doesn't believe for us. He doesn't do, he doesn't uh, repent for us. And that's really a paradox in Christianity. There's a couple things in Christianity that are paradoxes when two things are true and they seem like they conflict, but they don't. So these two things, like it's given to us as a gift. He does it. We still believe, we choose to believe. So these two things, like how do they interact? It's hard it is hard, but that's, they're both true. So we, we choose, we repent. He doesn't believe for us, but we're given those things as a gift. So those two things exist together. Um, but as we look at these things, these, these works are going to play out through us. And this life that is, that's fueling the work, this connection to Christ is going to look different in everyone. So everybody, if you, if I asked two of you to do the same thing for the church or whatever, it would look different. You go about it different ways because everyone thinks everyone's kind of unique. So this life that God is giving us is playing out differently in everyone. So when you look at this, we are God's workmanship. The, wor- the word for workmanship in the original language is poema, and it's the root word for poem. So it's like an action, a, a, a artwork. Um, so it's doing something, but it's also kind of like artistic. And so in each of our lives, this life is coming forth in unique ways. And that's why it says he's prepared works for us to do ahead of time for us to do. He has these things ready for us because we're all unique and he's working this out. So as we live our lives, 
and we do things for God, it's beautiful because God's working through us uniquely. And we all become this unique trophy of grace that, that we portray to other people. Um, and it's like a tapestry of just all these threads coming together in our lives and these good works that we do. Um, and we become the artwork of God. So that's really what I wanted to look at this morning. Like look at, we were spiritually dead and people are still spiritually dead, but the life, but God moves and gives us the life and, and changes everything about us. And so how does that play out in our lives? It becomes a workmanship type. It's a, we become like an art form, a painting of God's that he's slowly working on. And as we grow, we start to show God more efficiently and effectively. And, um, we, we start to understand God better. Um, so what do we do with these things? I think in response to this, this truth, we can do three things, and it's the motto of our church. We can engage. So don't give up on people out in the world because it's not you that has to convince them of God. It's really God's work. So there's, not, there's hope for anyone. So when you go up to people, and sometimes we get jaded because people have just rejected it so much, and we don't, uh, we're like, they're just never going to get it. But it's God, it's God. Like he can turn the light on instantly. So we shouldn't ever give up hope. Um, and it's not really us failing if someone rejects it. It's, it's God working on their hearts. And so we do the best that we can. So engage with people around us and the people out in the world, like, and just our friends and neighbors that we think are, don't have the spiritual life. Don't give up on them, uh, keep trying. So engaging, exalting uh, worship time. So this worship we had this morning, just thinking about everything praises him. If we can, and looking at these verses here, if we can get an accurate uh, a picture of who God is and what he does and just the, the character of who he is, the deeper we get to know God, the better we know our Bible, we're seeing him in here, he's talking to us through the Bible, we better understand God and we get to love him more. Usually when you get to know him more, you love him more. And what ideally will happen is as you exalt God by knowing him better, the things in your life that you love, the sin that we grasp onto, uh, the, to our detriment starts to release because we know God more. A greater love is, is displacing the old love. So we start to love him more and, and to love these things less. We turn away from the sin. So exalting him, worshiping him, looking at these verses, reading our Bible, doing the studies, it is, it is exalting God and, our, and increasing this love and it's putting away the other things and putting away that love. So exalting him and then encouraging each other. So the life is working in all of us differently. And so I encourage you to, if there's, an, if there's a place here in church or, you know, in the body of Christ that you feel led that you think you could contribute to, do that, like, and, and, and work towards it. And some, we have all, we all have things that we think and do better naturally. Some we're gifted at. Sometimes we enjoy things we're not super gifted at, but we enjoy it still. So uh, find those things and, and plug in. And uh, sometimes you can just find your niche in the church and say, well, it doesn't really exist yet. So you can start it, you know, do it and start doing the things and, and start building it. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do and just thinking through what's your specific, like how, how does the artwork look for you that God's making? What's the masterpiece going to be in your life that God's slowly tweaking and, and making and, and pulling forth? So we want to do those things. We want to encourage each other through that. So exalting by not giving up on people, um, sorry, engaging by not giving up on people, exalting by worshiping and, and just understanding him better and then encouraging each other through, uh, through doing these actions and works. So I want to finish up here by looking at um, a, a song that was written by Charles Wesley, who is the brother of the guy I referenced earlier, John Wesley. John Wesley and Charles, they're brothers. They started Methodist movement together. Charles was kind of the hymn writer and really the more likable guy in the, in the duo. Like people like Charles and John was the, the, the thinker. Um, but so this is a, a hymn that Charles Wesley wrote. And I'd like to finish with that. It says, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. So it's all of God, all of mercy and grace. Let's pray.
So Heavenly Father, we thank you just for today and for your word and the fact that we can get to know you better, to have a relationship with you. We thank you that you've moved in our lives, that you've made this change in us. We have life. And we thank you for that. It's a mystery of why you would do it. But we thank you that you did do it. And help us. I pray a blessing on everyone here. Help us to live these things out. Help us to show your mercy and grace to this dying world, the spiritually dead. Help us to show you off to them. Be trophies of your grace. So I pray even in this coming week for us to find ways that we can do that, that we can live out this truth. And it's, I ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. As we close with uh, just one more uh, tune, um, I encourage you, uh, this is a great, these are certain Sundays are just good times to just stop and to do some self-examination, yes, asking God to, you know, reveal, you know, your inner soul and, and really do some heart work. Sometimes singing gets in the way. Um, and so we don't always just want to stand and sing. That's not always the most healthy thing. So I'm convinced that going through a passage like this, uh, it hits each one of us maybe slightly different, but like Derek was, was encouraging us to remember that if we're Christians in this room, we all are uh, very much aware of our deadness before Christ and the constant war that goes through the, the, the lifespan uh, that, that we have. And so there's this constant wrestling. Um, but then there's the joy uh, of the grace of God. And that just... That, that should never become a common thing for us. That's the most, that's the most uh, terrifying thought uh, to me is, is, Lord, that I would ever be uh, just used to his grace. It's just, it's just there, you know, no big deal kind of thing. I don't ever want to be there, and I don't ever want to lead anybody towards a, a state of mind like that. So this song is called Majesty. There's freedom in the room to sit and pray. You can stand if you'd like. There is no, there is no uh, measure this way or that. You, but let's do business with God. Let's ask him to search our hearts as we close with this song.
from the Holy One and love that is richer than any love we can ever fathom, richer than any movie has ever tried to show. What grace, what mercy. And so this week, Lord, we, we are in desperate need again because we're constantly bending towards the flesh just like Derek was teaching us through Ephesians we constantly d- prefer the darkness as John puts it in the word we prefer the darkness and we need a daily power source of the Holy Spirit and Lord that only starts in a, in a mindset and a heart set of humility and so God remind us of our sin day to day remind us of your grace even more the way that you want to use us for your kingdom. This week, God, send us to the lost and may we speak truth with humility in our hearts and just watch, just watch how you work. This is for your glory, Lord. This is not for our kingdom or our name. This is for your glory and for the good of people. So Lord, give us an urgency this week. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your work. Thank you that your word is effective and that it's enough, it's sufficient for us. And so, Lord, help us to hold it tight and close to our hearts and then to to, to, uh, proclaim it with love and humility to the society around us, to people you send to us. Give us courage, give us faith as we walk in your grace and your mercy this week. Lord, we love you. Thank you in the name of Christ. Majesty, majesty, you are highly exalted, Christ Jesus. We love you.